This hearing will come to order. This hearing is in the virtual format, so I want to do a few reminders before we begin. Uh, once you start speaking, there will be a slight delay before you're displayed on the screen. To minimize background noise, please click the mute button until it's your turn to speak or to ask questions. And you should all have one box on your screens that's labeled clock, and it will show how much time you have remaining. Uh, for witnesses, you'll have five minutes for opening statements. You can submit a written statement that's as long as you want. Um, for all senators, the five minute clock also applies for your questions. Now, at 30 seconds remaining for your statements and questions, you're going to hear a little bell ring just to remind you that your time has almost expired and it's going to ring again when your time has expired. If there's a technology issue, we'll just move to the next witness or the next senator until it gets resolved. And to simplify the speaking order process, Senator Kennedy and I have just agreed to go by seniority for this hearing. So I'm going to start with an opening statement here. And let me start by saying good afternoon and welcome to this session's second hearing of the Economic Policy Subcommittee. Today's hearing focuses on the opportunities presented by a central bank digital currency. This is a bipartisan hearing. In fact, it was ranking member Kennedy's suggestion to hold it. And I want to thank him and I want to thank his team for working so closely with us to get it put together. Now, the core subject of this hearing is not Bitcoin or Dogecoin or any other cryptocurrency. Instead, it's the explosion of cryptocurrencies over the last decade that has created the context for understanding the potential value and risks of digital currency. There are substantial difficulties with our current payment system. Nearly 33 million Americans have been locked out of the traditional banking system. They're forced to use check cashers and payday lenders for basic banking services. And even those with traditional checking and savings accounts find that many of the largest banks have proven to be untrustworthy, gouging customers for overdraft or other fees, or in the case of Wells Fargo, just outright cheating their customers with fake accounts and fake services for which the customers pay dearly. So what are the alternatives? Digital currencies have been hyped as a solution to these problems. Early advocates claim that cryptocurrencies would open up the financial system and deliver fast, cheap, and secure payments to anyone with an internet connection. Others pointed out that crypto was a way to avoid the risks of dealing with giant banks that squeezed customers dry. But crypto's promises haven't come to pass. Instead, here's what's happening in the real world with cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies have turned out to be a fourth-rate alternative to real currency. First, cryptocurrencies are a lousy way to buy and sell things. Unlike the dollar, their value fluctuates wildly, depending on the whims of speculative day traders. You know, in just the last two months, the value of Dogecoin increased by more than tenfold and then declined by nearly 60%. Now, that may work for speculators and fly-by-night investors, but not for regular people who are looking for a stable source of value to get paid in and to use for day-to-day -day spending. Second, crypto is a lousy investment. Unlike, say, the stock market, the crypto world currently has no consumer protection, none. As a result, Honest investors and people trying to put aside some savings are at the mercy of fraudsters. Uh, pump and dump schemes are outlawed in the case of ordinary stock, but they have become routine in crypto trading. One study found that the level of price manipulation in cryptocurrency is, and I quote, unprecedented in modern markets. And third, crypto has become a haven for illegal activity. Online theft, drug trafficking, ransom attacks, and other illegal activity have all been made easier with crypto. Experts estimate that last year more than $412 million was paid to criminals in ransom through cryptocurrencies. 
And unlike other payment systems that make it tougher to move money illegally, a key feature of crypto is its secrecy. So just in the past few weeks, cryptocurrencies made it possible for hackers to collect the ransom, to release the colonial pipeline hack, and to free JBS, the world's largest meat producer, from paralyzing cyber attacks. And every hack that is successfully paid off with a cryptocurrency becomes an advertisement for more hackers to try more cyber attacks. Finally, there are the environmental costs of crypto. Many cryptocurrencies are created through proof of work mining. Uh, it involves using computers to solve useless mathematical puzzles in exchange for newly minted cryptocurrency tokens. Such mining has devastating consequences for the climate. Some crypto mining is set up near coal plants, spewing out filth in return for a chance to harvest a few crypto coins. Total energy consumption is staggering, driving up demand for energy. If for example, Bitcoin, just one of the cryptocurrencies, were a country, it would already be the 33rd largest energy user in the world, using more energy yearly than all of the Netherlands. And all those promised benefits, the currency that would be available at no cost to millions of unbanked families, and that would provide a haven from the tricks and traps of big banks, well, those benefits haven't materialized. Meanwhile, cryptocurrency has created opportunities to scam investors, assist criminals, and worsen the climate crisis. The threats posed by crypto show that Congress and federal regulators can't continue to hide out, hoping crypto will go away. It won't. It's time to confront these issues head on. Crypto has significant problems, but our current payment system also has significant problems. Both the government and banks have dragged their heels for years, resisting innovation and evidently taking the same hide and wait approach to facing the worldwide movement into cryptocurrencies. Central bank digital currency, which is often called CBDC because the world needs another acronym, uh, digital currency from central banks has great promise. Legitimate digital public money could help drive out bogus digital private money. It could help improve financial inclusion, efficiency, and the safety of our financial system if that digital public money is well designed and efficiently executed, which are two very big ifs. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses today about how a central bank digital currency would work, why it might be necessary, how it intersects with cryptocurrency, and most importantly, how it should be set up so that all Americans can enjoy its benefits. And with that, I'll turn to you, Senator Kennedy. Would you like to do an opener here? I, I would, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. I thought Chair Warren did a did a very good job of outlining um, the disadvantages of cryptocurrency. That's not really what I want to focus on, um, and the challenge in terms of how our regulatory platforms deal with those disadvantages. I was reading an article the other day that made the point. Some may agree, some may disagree, but the uh, the quickest way to get rid of ransomware and what it's doing uh, to our various countries is to get rid of cryptocurrency. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready to go that far, but I thought it was a salient point. I jotted down a few notes, which I'm, I'm going to refer to here. I don't normally do this, but I want to uh, be as concise as possible so we can, can get to our, uh, our witnesses. Uh, this is an important topic. Uh, this is a, I see this as an opportunity today to explore uh, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of a central bank digital currency. As Chair Warren uh, uh, referred to, we call that uh, CBDC. I, I agree with her about the need for another acronym. Um, will it work for the United States? Will it work for the world? What value will it 
If any, will it contribute to U.S. monetary policy and world monetary policy? Uh, technology continues to emerge in our financial system and specifically in our payment system. I think uh, the demand for digital payments and the influx of, uh, of what I'll call non-legal non tender, uh, like cryptocurrencies, to me, it's clearly going to uh, uh, continue to explode. Uh, these forms of payments, I think we all know, have operated outside our traditional payments infrastructure. As the chair pointed out, they proved to be volatile. They proved to be controversial. They proved to be speculative. Uh, they proved to be subject to manipulation in some cases. Um, we've seen that with respect to Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, I don't mean just to pick on Bitcoin, uh, other uh, forms of cryptocurrency. Um, cryptocurrencies and stable coins, though, I think we have to, if we're honest with ourselves, we have to admit that they're on the rise and we need to examine the risks that a decentralized currency would pose to the Federal Reserve's control of monetary policy. Maybe that's self-evident, but I think it needs to be stated. Uh, the United States is, is leading the world in innovation and technology. The United States dollar, and we're all very proud of this, has remained the world's primary reserve currency. We want to keep it that way. Many uh, governments around the world, as you know, are exploring a CBDC for use in today's digital world. I think the United States uh, should also do that, explore as we are doing. Um, but we have to understand, it seems to me, and I hope we'll learn more about this today, that uh, whether public demand exists, who would benefit most? from a CBDC has to be asked. And who would benefit least? And who wouldn't benefit at all? And who would be hurt? And we also have to take an honest look at whether the juice is worth the squeeze when it comes to, to cost, when it comes to security risks. Now, as we know, China has created its own digital currency. We've all read about it, uh, the digital yuan. It uses that, not the people of China, uh, who I have great regard for, but the government of China, which I have little regard for because it's run by a bunch of pirates. Uh, the government of China has used the digital yuan to monitor everyday transactions of its citizens. It has used it to broaden its massive surveillance system. I think there's a lesson there. Uh, additionally, China is using its CBDC to maintain greater control over its economy and to expand China's monetary influence in the world. And I think uh, we need to be mindful of that. And we've got to analyze the impl implications of a Chinese CBDC on global competitiveness, uh, on international commerce, and the U.S. dollar's position as the global wor uh, world currency. Um, I'll, I'll try to cut through some of this. I, I'm also, I need to mention this. I'm very concerned. I don't want to overstate it, but it's a question that has to be addressed. Proposals that uh, would use a CBDC to, uh, to, to fundamentally change our current banking system. Um, I think we need to explore that. I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, CBDC should be used to replace the paper dollar or to replace bank deposits. Uh, if the U.S. chooses to hold a CBDC, it, it needs to do so, it seems to me, in a way that complements our current financial system. Uh, there was a superb article in, uh, I think, The Economist last week or the week before last that talked about uh, a CBDC, not just as a payment system, but it's its implications for the credit markets. Um, do, do, do we want the federal government to get into the business of credit? And if it does, what does that mean for our commercial banking system? So I guess my point is we need to strike the right balance. We need to ask the hard questions. We need to listen and learn. And I want to thank our witnesses for being here today.
and for uh, sharing some of their time and, and educating us. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Senator Kennedy. And now, Senator Brown, you're recognized for an opening statement. Thank you, Chair Warren and your Ranking Member Kennedy. And thanks to my friend, uh, Ranking Member Toomey, for being part of this hearing, too. And uh, Senator Warren, thanks for, and, and Senator Kennedy both, thanks for making this subcommittee as active as it's become already. I'm glad that our subcommittee economic policy convened this hearing to explore how a central bank's digital currency can be designed to maintain our country's leadership in the global economy, to make our economy work better for workers and their families. That's kind of the whole point. Other countries around the world are already taking steps to establishing central bank digital currencies. I think we agree the United States must not be left behind. We need to lead the way. As millions of working families in this country know, it's expensive to be poor. Check cashing fees, transfer fees, late fees, overdraft fees. We hear all kinds of promises about how crypto and digital currencies would be more inclusive alternatives to the current banking system. But the approaches offered by crypto companies so often are just simply not solutions. They're just another volatile, risky asset for Wall Street speculation and put some people's hard-earned money and potentially our entire financial system at risk. One way we give Americans more control over their money is through my plan for no-fee accounts available to every American at a post office or a small bank or a credit union backed by the Federal Reserve. Americans shouldn't have to pay exorbitant fees just to use the money they've already earned. People could receive money, take out cash, pay their bills online without fees. A central bank digital currency can work with these no-fee accounts to make sure working families have access to the payment system and full participation in our economy. It's time for our banking system, Madam Chair, as you know, to work as well for everyone as it does for Wall Street. Thanks for giving me a couple of minutes, Madam Chair. Well, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Chair Brown, who is the head of the, uh, is the chair of our Banking and Housing Committee, and I appreciate your being here today. <laughs> Senator Senator uh, Toomey, I appreciate your being here today as well. You're recognized if you'd like to make an opening statement. Yeah, thank you, Chair Warren. And, and I too wanna to thank you and Senator Kennedy for having this hearing. This is a fascinating and very important topic. Uh, I would just like to suggest that as we consider the creation of a central bank digital currency in the United States, one of the most fundamental questions we need to ask ourselves is, what problem is the central bank digital currency trying to solve? In other words, do we need one? Uh, it's not yet clear to me that we do. I know there's there's some who think that a central digital, a central bank digital currency uh, would be helpful because it would enable the Fed to provide retail banking accounts to Americans. Now, in my view, turning the Fed into a retail bank is not a good idea. Our retail banks actually do a great job of serving the needs of consumers because they compete with one another in the private sector. But it's not just banks. Beyond banks, rapidly evolving technology companies are expanding access to the financial system, providing all types of financial products and services to consumers, including people of very modest means. I don't think we need a state-sponsored bank interfering with this very successful free enterprise system. Nor do we want a government entity like the Fed positioned to possibly infringe on our privacy, uh, able to track our personal information and monitoring our banking transactions. And does anyone think that the government would provide the high quality customer service that consumers want from a retail bank? The Fed, after all, has absolutely no experience in that realm. I know others suggest that the U.S. needs to create a central bank digital currency in order to compete with China. Um, the fact that China may well be creating a digital currency doesn't mean it's inevitable that the yuan would replace the dollar as a world's reserve currency. In fact, there are a lot of reasons to believe China's digital currency won't be terribly appealing. China, after all, has a state-controlled economy, has a repressive authoritarian government that's got capital controls on the yuan that make it unattractive as a reserve currency. And let's face it, China's motivation for launching a digital currency in the first place undoubtedly includes tightening its grip on its economy and enhancing surveillance of its citizens. And it would like to be able to surveil others. Uh, China likely wants to track every single transaction done with its digital currency and directly control this currency. With features like this, it's doubtful, in my view, that people will flock to the digital yuan and abandon the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. 
While I'm not at all certain that we need a central bank digital currency, I think we should consider the development of private digital currencies. After all, it's been the private sector, not the government, that's been responsible for developing cryptocurrencies, including stable coins, which, by the way, uh, can be perfectly stable with respect to the dollar and have no price volatility at all with respect to the dollar. Private digital currencies have the potential to increase access to financial services for all Americans while increasing individual privacy. Now, people have raised legitimate, important issues about private digital currencies, including their use in illicit activity and the possibility that they could affect monetary policy and our existing financial infrastructure. I think we need to discuss these, we need to understand these issues, and we may well need to address them. But we shouldn't lose sight of the tremendous benefits that the underlying technology of digital currencies offers and that disintermediated payments can offer as well. That's why I think we should encourage the continued development of private digital currencies. I look forward to, this, to today's discussion, and I thank our witnesses for sharing their expertise. Thank you, Senator Toomey. And again, appreciate your being here today. So now I'm going to introduce today's witness panel. First, we have Dr. Neha Narula, uh, who serves as the director of the Digital Currency Initiative at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Next, we'll have the Honorable Chris Giancarlo, Senior Counsel at Wilkie Farr and Gallagher and the former chairman of the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission. After that, we'll have Mr. Lev Minand, an academic fellow, lecturer in law and postdoctoral research scholar at Columbia Law School. And lastly, we'll hear from Dr. Daryl Duffy, the Adams Distinguished Professor of Management and Professor of Finance at Stanford Graduate School of Business. So thank all of our witnesses for being here today. And let's start with you, uh, Dr. Nehrula. Uh, you have five minutes. Great, thank you, Chair Warren, uh, Ranking Member Kennedy, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Neha Narula, and I'm the director of the Digital Currency Initiative at MIT. We focus on cryptocurrency and digital currency design. I'd like to note that my views are my own and not the views of MIT or the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, with whom we are engaged in a multi-year research collaboration, Project Hamilton. We'll be releasing a paper and open source software this summer. Today, I'm going to do three things. Define CBDC and its benefits. Give examples of questions that need to be answered before launching a US CBDC, a digital dollar, and suggest ways to answer those questions. The high fees, long delays, inequitable access, and low innovation in our traditional payment systems have caused central banks to consider issuing digital forms of their currency to the public. Traditional sim systems simply have not kept pace with the demand for online commerce. Many central banks are engaging in work on CBDC to improve payment efficiency, facilitate financial inclusion, and maintain financial stability. A general purpose or retail CBDC is defined as a digital liability of a nation's central bank that is broadly accessible to the general public. That it is a central bank liability distinguishes it from commercial bank money and credit cards. Its digital nature sets it apart from cash and it is different from central bank reserves in that users can hold it directly. The promise of a CBDC goes beyond payment efficiency and financial inclusion. Digital currency offers an opportunity for a ground up redesign of our payment systems. If built in the right way, a digital dollar might empower users and create a platform for innovation and payments, much as the internet created a platform for innovation by facilitating the transfer of information. Now, though promising, the way forward is not entirely clear. There are many open questions regarding how a US CBDC should operate, how users might access it, how consumer privacy would be protected, and if a CBDC is the best way to achieve goals such as increasing financial inclusion. For example, 36% of those in the US who lack bank accounts also do not have smartphones. Many Americans do not have reliable internet connectivity. Such people could not use a digital currency that requires a mobile app or a constant connection to the internet. At MIT, we're investigating designs that would enable forms of secure offline transactions. 
Financial transactions reveal sensitive data about our lives and protecting privacy is essential for human dignity in a democratic society. Consumer privacy is a requirement for US CBDC as well as a potential competitive advantage. Yet much work remains to determine how to guarantee privacy while still providing the information necessary to combat illicit activity. More research is needed to determine how a CBDC might address these challenges. It would be a mistake to move to using a CBDC without understanding the implications for financial inclusion and privacy. Extensive collaboration between academic researchers and the public and private sectors, as well as research funding, is needed to make progress on these key questions. The first step is to obtain agreement on goals. In parallel, the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve should be investing more in research and development, not to build the digital dollar, but to fully understand its possibilities and implications, as well as spur technology development. To build consensus across varied stakeholders and create a neutral environment where the best ideas can flourish, we should rely on the principles of open source software development. The government's typical way of building systems, outsourcing to a third party vendor, will not, in my opinion, work here. What is possible in terms of policy is inextricably linked to the technical implication. The US cannot outsource monetary policy to a vendor. As a first step, I recommend expanding the type of work that MIT is currently doing with the Boston Fed and expanding other collaborations between academia and the public sector. In conclusion, we have a once in a century opportunity to redesign the dollar. Central bank digital currency might have the potential to increase financial inclusion, reduce transaction costs, and become a platform for innovation and payments if designed and implemented well. I commend the subcommittee for raising this important issue and encouraging this critical dialogue. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. So thank you very much, Dr. Narula. Um, Mr. John Carlo, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Warren, Ranking Member Kennedy, and members of the committee. I'm Chris John Carlo, Senior Counsel at Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. I'm here today on behalf of the Digital Dollar Project, a nonpartisan think tank formed over a year ago to discuss the merits of a tokenized form of a US central bank digital currency that we termed a digital dollar. I commend this committee for considering the challenges and opportunities of a digital dollar, including its potential for greater access, inclusion, and betterment of the financial system. 12 months ago, we proposed a tokenized bearer instrument issued by the Federal Reserve distributed through the two-tiered banking system and operated alongside physical currency and commercial bank money. This digital dollar would mirror many of the properties of physical cash, enjoying the full faith and credit of the US government, but in a digital form. Instead of withdrawing paper dollars from an ATM and putting them in a leather wallet, you could withdraw digital dollars into a digital wallet on a smartphone. You could then spend digital dollars directly, peer to peer, at the corner grocery or online around the globe. Now, many thoughtful commentators, including members of this committee, are rightly concerned with the risks of such a digital dollar, including its impact on fractional banking and financial stability, energy consumption, current payment models, economic privacy, and the reserve currency status of the dollar. And I assure you, as a former chief regulator, I share the inclination to look at what could go wrong with new innovation, including digital money. However, as a thought experiment, I'd also like to consider for just a moment what could go right. Some worry that a digital dollar might decrease money held in commercial banks. But what if the opposite happens? What if more money moves into the banking sector, especially if previously on or under bank communities shift digital dollars into bank accounts? because the ease of doing so? And what if mobile devices and digital wallets provide attractive on-ramps to banking services, offering interest on deposits and government insurance? And what if greater ease in converting commercial bank money into digital dollars would make people less likely to do so in a panic? Now, I know many of you are rightly concerned with energy consumption, but what if a digital dollar used much, much less energy than Bitcoin and other decentralized proof of work digital assets? But what is it if it also used even less energy than is currently used for physical mining, minting, and distribution of paper dollars and metal coins? Now, some are concerned that a digital dollar could negatively impact current business models for payments. But what if a digital dollar actually lowers payment costs and bank fees for consumers and small businesses? What if it provides instantaneous settlement 
reducing cash flow stress that plagues small businesses and American consumers with costly overdraft and other fees? And what if the economic benefits of, of increased activity from digital money results in expanding economic opportunity, small business formation, and productivity? Now, fourth, all of us are rightly concerned with infringing individual privacy through mass surveillance of digital money. But what if a digital dollar was carefully engineered from the outset to incorporate Americans' reasonable expectations of individual privacy consistent with our Fourth Amendment? And what if we strike the right balance between the legitimate needs of law enforcement with constitutional protections of individual privacy? And what if a digital dollar with such American legal and due process limitations provides superior protection of individual privacy compared to many other sovereign and indeed non-sovereign commercial digital currencies? And lastly, some argue that the dollar status as the world's reserve currency is so well entrenched, it requires no further innovation. But what if a digital dollar improves the financial stability, productivity, and efficiency while enhancing the dollar with new functionality, ease of use, and smart contract programmability? And if we add to these enhancements um, our recognized competitive advantages of the dollars, that's the backing of a robust and strong economy and good governance and the rule of law, what if we do all those things while protecting individual privacy and faith to our finest national ideals? Would we not then have done our duty to prepare the US dollar to serve our fellow citizens in the coming digital future of money? In closing, I thank this committee for considering this topic with appropriate prudence, caution, and thoughtfulness. And I doing so, I hope we not forget to consider what could go right. Only real world testing will show whether the squeeze, whether the juice is worth the squeeze in Senator Kennedy's words. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. John Carlo. I appreciate it. And uh, now, uh, Mr. Menand, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chair Warren, ranking member Kennedy, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. Um, I'm a lecturer in law and academic fellow at Columbia Law School. And in June of 2018, along with Morgan Ricks and John Crawford, I proposed that Congress authorize the Federal Reserve to offer a retail central bank digital currency through a program we call Fed Accounts. Fed Accounts would be available to any US resident or business in digital wallets operated by community banks and the post office. These wallets would charge no fees and have no minimum balances. They would come with debit cards, direct deposit, and bill pay. Their balances would be non-defaultable no matter how large, just like physical cash. They could be exchanged instantly, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They would have customer service, privacy safeguards, and fraud protection. If you lost your password, there would be someone you could call. And they would earn interest at the same rate that the Fed pays to banks. To understand how this system would work, it helps to situate it within our existing money and payment system. The government currently creates two types of dollars for the general public physical dollars and deposit dollars. It creates the first type directly through the Mint and the Fed. It outsources the second type to publicly chartered, privately owned banks. The second type is more important. We use it to pay the rent, receive our salaries, and save up for a rainy day. These are digital dollars already, and there are over 17 trillion of them circulating, more than 10 times the amount of cash in circulation domestically. This system is stable with people treating their deposit balances as equivalent to cash only because the government stands behind deposit balances. The government is the franchisor. It charters banks and backs them. The banks are the franchisees. They interact with the depositors and create the deposits. The government also facilitates transfers. When depositors want to pay a customer of another bank, the Fed assists through a program called Fedwire and another program called Fed ACH. If depositors want cash instead of deposits, banks can go to the Fed and get cash at a program called a discount window. If a bank makes too many bad loans and fails, a government corporation, the FDIC, steps in to ensure that the bank's deposits can still be exchanged for cash. But there are a variety of problems with this system, with the digital dollars we already have. It leaves a lot of people out. Over 6% of US households do not have access to deposit money at all. It's costly. 
Banks charge high fees for transferring and holding deposits, and it is slow. Checks drawn on deposit accounts take up to two days to clear. There's also an urgent second order problem, dangerous deposit substitutes that are not issued by banks. One group of these deposit substitutes has been around for decades and crashed the economy in 2008. These are euro dollars, repos, and money funds. Another group is new. These include stable coins, and cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. In good times, these alternative monies can be exchanged faster and more efficiently than bank digital dollars. In the long run, they undermine financial stability, threaten severe recessions, weaken the US internationally, and enable ransomware attacks, money laundering, and tax evasion. On its own, a CBDC like Fed account can't solve all these problems, but it can help. It can bring millions of people into the mainstream financial system. It can speed up payments. It can reduce high fees. It can bolster financial stability by crowding out dangerous deposit substitutes. It can reduce regulatory complexity. It can improve monetary policy transmission, and it can generate revenue for the government. For all these reasons, Congress should authorize the Fed to update our money and payments infrastructure for the 21st century. I look forward to answering your questions. So thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it, Mr. Menand. Uh, and now we come to our final witness, Dr. Duffy. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chair Warren, uh, Ranking Member Kennedy and members of the committee. Today, I'd like to explain why I believe you should authorize the Fed to go ahead and develop a central bank digital currency. The decision to deploy this digital dollar can be delayed until a resulting design can be evaluated for the costs and benefits that we've all been discussing today. This development process will require significant resources and time, perhaps even more than five years. Designing an effective central bank digital currency that safeguards privacy while controlling illegal payments will be challenging, as Dr. Narula has explained and as I detail, in my written testimony. While developing the digital dollar, relevant US government agencies should address shortcomings of the existing US bank payment rails, which are generally slow and expensive to use. Regulation that promotes a competitive payments market and the development of a viable CBDC may spur firms that provide the current bank rail payment system to compete more aggressively in terms of both pricing and technology innovation. And as noted last month by Federal Reserve Governor Leo Brainerd, the United States should also position itself with a seat at the table of international discussions regarding standards for the design and appropriate uses of CBDCs. The US should also prepare a muscular strategy for deflecting undesirable and invasive types of cryptocurrencies as they gain traction in US payments. As you said, Chair Warren, a digital dollar can play a role here by providing an attractive and officially supportive alternative. U.S. banks, though, are capable of providing an effective low-cost payment system, but they have not done so. Current regulations, network effects that limit entry, and profit incentives have not promoted an open, innovative, and competitive market, as I explain in my written testimony. Calls for alternatives such as fintech payment firms, private stable coins, and CBDCs have been incited by the low efficiency and high cost of the current bank rail payment system. The Fed has had to step in with the development of its own real-time payment system, FedNow. FedNow will improve the speed of payments and offers other efficiencies, but brings no assurance of significantly improved competition for payment services. A further impetus for the digital dollar is financial inclusion, as my colleagues on the panel have explained. Also, as Dr. Narula explained, this is not a simple matter. Looking at the international side, China's new digital currency will not add much of a threat to the global dominance of the US dollar, but will likely open commercial opportunities for China in some emerging market economies. This will increase China's influence in these countries which US foreign policy experts may wish to consider very carefully, supporting Senator Kennedy's remarks. It advantages the US to have its own digital currency technology to offer countries may wish to lower the cost 
costs or advance the development time for introducing their own CBDCs. The United States should also support the development of international agreements that would set standards of care for protecting foreign monetary systems from disruption by another country's CBDC. In conclusion, the United States should now begin a significant program for the development of a digital dollar. The design should prioritize the efficiency of payments, privacy, financial inclusion, and the ability to monitor payments for compliance. Even a well-resourced development program can be expected to take a number of years to achieve a successful design. The final decision to deploy the digital dollar can be delayed until more is learned. In parallel with the development of a digital dollar, increased efforts should be made to improve the competitiveness and efficiency of the existing bank rail payment system. Regulations can be changed to further encourage innovation and competition. The Fed, for example, has recently considered offering accounts to novel payment firms under appropriate conditions. The United States should also take a leadership position in intergovernmental discussions of CBDCs, particularly with respect to their cross-border uses. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Duffy. Appreciate your being here today. So let's start our questions. I recognize myself uh, to get started here for five minutes. As our witnesses have described, digital currencies offer a lot of potential advantages over cash in your wallet or even the electronic balance on your debit card. Uh, you don't have to worry about carrying cash around and losing it or having it stolen. If you wanna send money to somebody else, digital currency can be easier and faster. But in order for those advantages to be realized, the digital version of cash needs to be secure, stable, and accepted everywhere. Your local grocery store is only going to accept digital currency if it knows that the digital version of the $100 that you use to pay for your groceries is actually worth $100. You know, your babysitter is only going to keep showing up if she knows that the digital $20 you sent her is really worth $20. So let's talk about using cryptocurrency like Bitcoin to pay for groceries or to pay for a babysitter. Dr. Narula, is the value of cryptocurrency like Bitcoin generally stable and reliable? Uh, thanks for the question, Senator Warren. Uh, no, it is not. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, we just witnessed the value of the entire cryptocurrency ecosystem dropping by about 40 percent over the course of the uh, the last two months. And, and how much money was that? Do you know in, in dollars what we think the value of that drop was? I think it was, a, I believe it was close to a trillion dollars. Yeah, about a trillion dollars that this thing dropped. But think about what it means for an individual uh, uh, seller. Like it means the grocery store could take in $100 in Bitcoin to pay for groceries. But by the end of the day, the Bitcoin could be worth only $60 in which case the store loses out. So these wild swings in value mean that Bitcoin is a terrible currency. In fact, that's why, except for criminals, most people are holding Bitcoin as a speculative investment, a way to make money rather than as a substitute for money, as a way to buy this week's groceries or to pay their babysitter. Now, the crypto industry knows about this problem, so they came up with so-called stable coins. And I think we heard a couple of references to that already today. This is a kind of cryptocurrency that claims to be pegged to the value of a fixed asset, like the dollar. Uh, Professor Menand, are these so-called stable coins as safe, reliable, and stable as, say, a digital dollar? that's issued by the Federal Reserve? No, no, Senator, certainly not. They're, they're much riskier. They're, they're dangerous to both their users and as they grow to the broader financial system. So whereas Bitcoin is something we really haven't seen before, stable coins are, they're the devil we know, just wearing new clothes. They're teched up versions of money market mutual funds in certain respects. There are a type of deposit substitutes and deposit substitutes are very unstable because the people who issue them don't have bank charters, they don't have deposit insurance, they don't have access to the Fed's discount window. And if people lose confidence in stable coins, 
uh, there's a good chance they'll dump them on mass in a sort of a classic run dynamic, and the people who are slow to get out could be left with significant losses. Okay, as you rightly point out, this, this is not the first time that we've had private sector alternatives to the dollar. In fact, I'm going to go back further than you did. Uh, in the 19th century, wildcat notes were issued by banks without any underlying assets. And eventually, the banks that issued these notes failed and public confidence in the banking system was undermined. The federal government stepped in, taxed these notes out of existence, and developed a national currency instead. And that's why we've had the stability of a national currency. So in theory, a digital currency issued and backed by a central bank could provide the advantages of cryptocurrency without those risks. The Federal Reserve, a trusted institution, could provide a digital version of cash to the public that is secure, stable, and accepted everywhere. So let me ask you, Professor Manand, what role could a central bank digital currency play in reducing these kinds of risks to financial stability? So a well a well designed CBDC could serve as a public alternative to these cryptocurrencies and potentially uh, crowd out their usage. In contrast to private digital currencies, CBDCs would be sovereign, non-defaultable money. They'd be cheaper to use, and they would not be subject to bank run dynamics. Right. So that's that's very helpful. Thank you. You know, there are reasons why cryptocurrencies are popping up like weeds. Our current banking system offers bad service or no service to millions of people and businesses. And swindlers have figured out how to skim profits off investors by buying and selling in a marketplace that has no cop on the beat. The risks of replaying the experience of the 19th century are real. These private actors issue their own dollar substitutes that they convince everyone are just as safe as the dollar itself until, of course, a crisis hits, their dollar substitutes fail, they threaten the entire financial system and drag down the whole economy. So I think what this hearing is about is exploring how central bank digital currency could serve the American people. But it's clear we need to improve our banking and payment systems. But the testimony and facts discussed here make it clear also that we need to address the threats that cryptocurrencies pose. So let me stop there. Uh, and uh, Ranking Member Kennedy, would you like to ask some questions? I would, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. I, I want to uh... I want to separate out for the moment cryptocurrencies. I, I think that's uh, the the uh, the failings and the advantages of a cryptocurrency. Could we could spend four or five hearings on that? And, and I know our regulatory authorities are, are trying now uh, to to understand how we should deal with it. But I want to put that aside and and talk about a uh, a digital dollar or digital currency which I define as one uh, initiated by the, the central bank. And, and I, I, I get the part that uh, the current payment system through private banks can be slow. Uh, it can be expensive. I think in one of our last hearings, um, uh, Chair Warren uh, uh, pointed out the, the amount of money made by one of our larger banks in the United States and overdraft fees. It was in the billions. I was, uh, I didn't know that. So I, I get that, that it can be expensive. And I can see conceptually how a digital currency, let me use the term digital dollar, could, could be faster and it could be cheaper. Um, what are the other advantages, though? And, a, and, a, and a, a, an inverse way of asking that question, aside from gaining more information about its people, why is China doing it? Let, let, me, let me start. Um, I want to hear from all of you. Let me start with uh, uh, Commissioner, our Chairman uh, Giancarlo, who was formerly chair of the CFTC. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. You know, when, when I look around the globe, I, I see that the BIS says that over 80, as close to 90 percent of reporting central banks are now looking at central bank digital currency. And I think three fifths of them 
actually have uh, existing experiments underway. Why is that? Well, I, I look and I see maybe six imperatives that are driving central banks here, but also around the world to, to take a close look at this. The first one is just as you said, it's about capturing data. I think that's what drove China at first with two of its uh, commercial enterprises, Alipay and WeChat Pay, being so successful in capturing its citizens' data. But I also think that drove a number of Western observers too with the launch of the potential for a, a digital currency by a social media platform. And suddenly I think policymakers were concerned about who was going to have the personal data of its citizens. But there's also been uh, initiatives for infrastructure of modernization. And certainly Singapore and our neighbor to the North Canada have got some very advanced experiments looking at infrastructure modernization. And then there is issues of financial inclusion. You know, our, our neighbor to the south, the Bahamas, has launched something called the sand dollar because they have citizens on out islands that have mobile service but don't have banking access. And so they're looking at it from a point of view of financial inclusion. And I think we ourselves in the United States are, are recognizing that that's a possibility. But so is precision distribution of funds as a matter of monetary policy. Certainly during the COVID crisis, when we tried to get checks in the hands of our fellow citizens, it didn't work out so well for those citizens that didn't have bank accounts or were stuck at home or otherwise couldn't work with a paper check. And then there comes the issue of geopolitical influence, which I think is certainly a driver for, for China with the combining its digital currency with its uh, Belt and Road Initiative. But lastly, and this perhaps for me is perhaps the most important reason, and that is who is going to set the standards if the future of money is digital. And certainly for the past 10 years, society outside of the official sector has been experimenting with digital money around the world. If the future is digital, then who's gonna set the standards? And China, by the way, has been very advanced in looking to set the standards. And that's one of the reasons why I think the United States needs to be more out front of experimenting with this so that we can be a standard setter and a okay. leader in, in standard uh -huh. setter. Thank you. I, I'm going to any additional time in the second round that the uh, chair provides to us. I'm going to ask all of you to answer this. Uh, why don't you get started for me, Dr. Darrell? Um, if you could tell me what uh, other than speed and cost, why else would we want to do a digital dollar in your well, opinion? If uh, oh. Yeah, in addition to the advantages that uh, Honorable Giancarlo just mentioned, I'll mention uh, one that came up earlier today, which is the fact that if a, if a type of cryptocurrency that you don't want is starting to get heavily used in your payment system, you're having difficulty monitoring the legality of transactions, money laundering, for example, or consumers may have difficulty uh, with the volatility of the currency that we just discussed, those can nevertheless become popular because uh, uh, cryptocurrencies have certain advantages for uh, smart contracting, for uh, token-based applications in the new digital economy, the internet of things, and uh, making payments that don't require uh, waiting for the banks to open, things like that. So what you want a, a central bank digital currency is to provide those services and displace the undesirable cryptocurrencies before they get traction in your economy. Now that's not to say that uh, CBDCs uh, win the day in terms of all costs and benefits, but on that point, I think many countries are currently exploring them for that specific reason to head off the invasion of an undesired cryptocurrency. That's what the Bank of Canada, for example, says that it's doing. All right, I, I'm uh, out of time. I'll come back to Dr. Uh, Narula and uh, Mr. Manand uh, and defer and, and defer back to our chair here. Okay, thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Reid. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Chairman. Ms. Manand, uh, following on this discussion of the central banks and the use of these new uh, digital currencies, uh, is it inevitable that the United States will, will go to a digital currency uh, in order to avoid being having the dollar displaced uh, as the currency of record of the world, at least at this moment? Uh, Senator, I don't think anything is inevitable. Um, and unfortunately, going to a digital currency is going to take a lot of work. Um, uh, but I think that 
there's a, a high likelihood that over time, more and more people will think that a digital currency issued by the central bank is something that the U.S. should uh, should be involved in. And so it's important to start that work now. Do you feel that China uh, in particular has a long-term strategy to develop a digital renminbi, I guess it would be, and deploy that uh, as it does so many other uh, uh, instruments of power with a deliberate uh, rationale of displacing the U.S. Currency. Yes, I, I, I do, Senator. I think this is a, a, a source of serious concern. Um, the launch of China's digital yuan last year poses a significant risk uh, to the U.S. The main problem is with the sanctions tool. One of the ways the U.S. advances its interests around the world um, is through the sanctions tool. And one of the ways the sanctions tool works is through the international payment system. And that system revolves around financial institutions. And because those institutions are all connected and they all pretty much do business in dollars, even those based abroad, like the Chinese commercial banks, have to comply with U.S. sanctions or risk being disconnected from the system. The Chinese CBDC is going to ultimately offer parties intent on evading U.S. sanctions a way to conduct business without interacting with financial institutions and therefore without touching the dollar payment system. So for example, a company in Thailand might be able to sell materials to North Korea or a company in Iran by paying in what the Chinese are calling ECNY, uh, potentially without the transaction hitting any Thai banks or other financial institutions. That's a serious risk to the US. Yeah, uh, just just final question is that uh, right now these cryptocurrencies are not uh, supported by and um, promoted by and part of the national central banks of any nation there, except the Chinese, as you point out, are trying to do that. Uh, even if uh, every major country went into a uh, position of issuing a digital currency, would the private digital currencies still exist and would they be disruptive to monetary policy i.e uh what when they, we try to raise interest rates in the united states they could take a contrary action yes i unfortunately i think they would still exist so while we can expect a central bank digital currency to crowd out uh some of these cryptocurrencies that we're seeing sprout up we need other policy responses as well uh, if, in order to address the harms those cryptocurrencies are posing, a central bank digital currency will be far from uh, sufficient. So, so you could envision perhaps an international agreement which uh, made these uh, private cryptocurrencies illegal and uh, legitimized only the centrally backed or central bank backed currency, something like that? I think there's definitely need for international coordination and there's a range of different tools that the government uh, and that, that, that global governments together have at their disposal. Uh, a ban of some sort is certainly one of the options the United States government has uh, used those types of tools in the past uh, during the Great Depression. For example, there was a ban on holding monetary gold um, in private possession. So that is the sort of the nuclear option, but there's a variety of other tools that the government can look at using as well to try to, to try to deal with these currencies, including the sanctions tool itself um, and uh, taxing tools, which uh, as Senator Warren pointed out, is something that the Congress employed in the 19th century to uh, create order in the monetary system and avoid chaotic uh, panic situations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Reed. Senator Haggerty? Senator Warren, Senator Kennedy, thank you for holding this hearing. You know, innovation is what will keep America's financial and capital markets the envy of the world. But the pace of change in financial technology, and especially with digital assets, makes our job challenging. The Federal Reserve should continue to explore a digital dollar. Near, nearly every other country is doing that. And when I asked Chairman Powell about a digital dollar in February, I appreciated his answer that we have a responsibility to get it right. I couldn't agree more. So the Fed must explore a digital dollar promptly and carefully. And the Fed should engage with the private sector. There are currently a number of products that are available in the private market that highlight some of the possibilities. And we shouldn't take steps that could threaten to disintermediate 
destabilize or drain significant deposits from the private sector lenders that underpin the strongest and most exceptional economy in the world. We should also understand the true problem that we're looking to solve with the digital dollar. What are the questions we're trying to solve? Is it a Fed-run digital dollar necessary to defend the U.S. dollar supremacy as the world's reserve currency and to maintain stability of the global financial system? Would China's digital currency suffer from the same drawbacks as its hard currency? And are there better ways to address potential risks from China's efforts? How would a Fed-run digital dollar impact cross-border payments? Could we better help those who are unbanked and underbanked by removing costly regulations or by continuing to encourage banks to expand their coverage rather than providing a publicly run banking option at the Fed? We also need to be practical about a digital dollar. We need to understand what are the costs to taxpayers to set this up and how long will it take? especially with everything else that the Fed is working on, including monetary policy, bank supervision, and Fed now real-time payments. We need to understand what are the cybersecurity risks. And we need to understand the privacy concerns for our citizens. None of us know exactly how financial innovation will evolve, but the last thing we want to do is constrain innovation. These discussions, providing market clarity and removing unnecessary regulatory obstacles, all help to move the ball forward. My first question uh, is coming to you, Chairman Giancarlo. You discussed what China is developing and the potential implications for that. In your mind, what are the biggest risks to the United States? Is it the loss of our ability to deploy sanctions? Is it the economic coercion? There are a number of reasons now why people are reluctant to hold China, China's currency. Would those reasons still apply to a digital renminbi? Uh, thank you, Senator Kennedy, uh, Sen Senator Haggerty. Uh, you know, in my testimony, I talked about the strength of the dollar as a reserve currency uh, being in underpinned by many strong pillars. And one is the fact that many of the world's most important ag and energy commodities, such as wheat and soybeans and crude oil, are priced in U.S. dollars. And it means that our farmers don't have to take foreign exchange risk, mm -hmm. while our overseas customers have to hold dollars. And these dollar prices are set not in cash markets, but in deep and liquid American commodity futures markets overseen by the CFTC, where I had the honor to serve. China recognizes this advantage as the world's largest consumer of many of these products, such as soybeans and crude oil and iron ore. China would much prefer they were priced in the Chinese currency. And that's one of the reasons why they have recently opened their futures markets for overseas no, I, participation. I, 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 for iron ore and mm. oil futures. When I was chairman, the Louis Dreyfus Corporation conducted the first large shipment of American soybeans to China, entirely using distributed ledger technology. And all contractual aspects of that shipment from bills of lading to receipt of shipment were conducted with, with all parties on one universal ledger. China is very advanced in distributed ledger technology. They've launched a national blockchain uh, service network to lead innovation. No other country, including the United States, has anything like it. It's only a matter of time before China will combine its lead in blockchain technology with its new digital currency and its futures markets to facilitate the entire process of logistics, payments, and price hedging for key world commodities in one integrated Chinese controlled blockchain. And that's why we must explore a tokenized form, I believe, of the US dollar that enables programmability with smart contracts, embedding the most complex business logic into CBDC tokens including contracts for hedging, logistics, and distribution of world commodities. Losing our edge to China in the pricing of key commodities is not just a concern to American agriculture, it's a concern to the U.S. economy. Well, thank you, Chairman Giancarlo, for your leadership, for all of your work in this area, and I applaud for your continued interest and support uh, as we move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Haggerty. Senator Warner. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate you having this hearing. This is a subject that I'm quite interested in as well. I'm actually stepping out of a Intel hearing that I'm chairing. So I want to ask the panel, and I think I'll start start with Dr. Morella and just go down the list. You know, we, we've seen both kind of good news and bad news recently, uh, and I know this is not directly to the um, the notion of a digital currency per se, but we've seen cryptocurrencies used as a preferred payment model uh, for, for ransomware. On, on the other hand, we've seen the very good news recently that um, uh, perhaps there's not as much anonymity as, as some had uh, promoted in the ability to trace back to that uh, 
uh, Bitcoin wallet and and um, um, be able to ferret out some of those dollars that went to to the the bad guys in Colonial Pipeline. But based on your research and engagement with crypto or issues, um, how as we think through digital currency and other related issues, how big a challenge is the um, are the the security risks? uh the the misuse of 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 these currencies have we been able to quantify that risk as we weigh the benefit the up and down benefits uh, and again dr Rello, why don't we start with you and i'd love everybody's comments uh thank you senator warner um i i think cybersecurity and security is the first order concern with uh any digital currency that the united states might decide to issue uh, it, whatever system underpins it would be national critical infrastructure. So we, we definitely have to make sure that we get that right. Uh, when it comes to things like the recent spate of ransomware attacks, uh, I think the real underlying problem here is that uh, we have this valuable data that has not been properly secured. Uh, it is true that cryptocurrency seems to uh, be the, the vector of choice. Um, however, it's also the case that because of its open uh, sort of auditable nature, that it's able to be a tool for law enforcement, uh, as you pointed out, to then track those funds and return them. Um, however, uh, ransomware, fundamentally, I think we, we have to uh, address that by fixing our systems and securing them. A central bank digital currency, if launched, would probably not look like a cryptocurrency exactly. Uh, and it's possible to build in safeguards to um, to make it more trackable and to, to prevent it being used for ransomware. However, as I said, uh, criminals will probably shift to whatever's easiest. And right. the real way to fix ransomware is to solve the underlying security problem. Agreed. Mr. Menard, and if we can make sure, I want to make sure I got two minutes left and I got uh, three more three more folks to talk. Sure. I, I see. I see. Cryptocurrencies is posing a serious uh, security threat. I think that they enable a type of ransomware that would be impossible otherwise. Think about it this way. If you wanted to hold up a U.S. company for $5 million and there were no cryptocurrencies, you'd have to ask for cash or check. If you ask for cash, you have to physically take delivery, which gives law enforcement the ability to easily track you. If you ask for check for a wire, you have to identify your bank account information. So it's just impossible. Um, crypto offers the ability, if you do it right, to use these mixers and tumblers and to convert between multiple currencies and to use various special cryptocurrencies that um, that are, are private, they're different from blockchain like Zcash, to hide your trail. And that's a major, major risk um, um, to, to U.S. law enforcement and national security going forward. I agree, although I do think we're, we are trying to find some, some other tools there. Dr. Duffy, and then... Uh, uh, Mr. Giancarlo? Yeah, I agree with the, the reply from Dr. Narula and Mr. Menand. The uh, US central bank digital currency needs to be bulletproof, and one needs to use very muscular regulatory strategies to tamp down the use of, of cryptocurrencies that are undesirable, like Bitcoin. The less accepted Bitcoin is in the broader economy, the more difficult it is for those that would wish to use it for illegal means can convert it into uh, uh, consumption or dollars. And so every effort should be made. In the end, though, as Mr. Menand said, it's going to exist on the fringe. And it's just a question of how uh, muscularly you can try to uh, reduce its use. Mr. Giancarlo? Yeah, yes, indeed. So so I, I would just add to, I think, the very, very thoughtful comments of my predecessors that, that the one of the benefits of perhaps a consensus-based mechanism, which we can learn from other forms of cryptocurrency, is the actually difficulty in hacking those systems when you build it on a broad-based distributed ledger system. Now, those are architectural issues and our, our colleagues at the Bank of Boston and MIT have been working on some of that core architecture. We're looking forward to their report. But I think that there are advantages that need to be explored in distributed ledger technology to make the system more resilient than perhaps the account-based system we have today, which has been hacked numerous times, even at the federal government level. Thank you, Madam Chair. I look forward to working with you on this issue and Senator Kennedy and others. Very much. Thank you, Senator Warner. Senator Lummis. Well, thanks very much, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Kennedy for holding this hearing on the future of the U.S. dollar. You know, if we build a central bank digital currency in the right way, we can strengthen the global role of the U.S. dollar and secure a strong financial future for next generations 
here in America. So uh, we've been working on my office uh, on some cornerstone principles uh, that we think should be used to judge a CBDC proposal. And among those is privacy. So my first question uh, is for Mr. Giancarlo. It's uh, nice to see you again. Um, one of the key motivations behind China's digital yuan is surveillance and control of their financial system. So it's clear that we cannot follow China down this road. Uh, any US CBDC should have greater privacy, uh, even the same or greater than physical cash today. Um, so do you agree that we must provide at least the same level of privacy? And how can strong privacy protections enhance the dollar's value on the global stage? Thank you, Senator. And by the way, my compliments on the launch of your innovation initiative, which I think is, is really terrific. Um, I think privacy comes down to one of the key issues behind design of a central bank digital currency. I, I, there's no question that China views their, develop, their development of a digital currency as a tool of state surveillance. Um, uh, that's, that seems very clear, and it, it would be very much in keeping with the nature of their government. We in the United States have a very different approach to economic privacy. We have a Fourth Amendment, and although the jurisprudence of that needs to be extended uh, beyond where it is today to extend to a, a, a digital currency, if we get the issue issue of privacy right, and that's a big issue, but if we get it right in a way that's consistent with our values, the, a digital dollar, believe it or not, could be the killer app of digital currencies worldwide. And why do I say that? Well, we know that the Chinese currency will be used for state surveillance. Europe is working, the EU is working on one, and they're guided by something called their GDPR, their privacy protection law. But that only protects from commercial exploitation of data, not from government use of data. We know that there are commercial entities that would like to develop coins that are tied to um, uh, social media and others that presumably will mine their currency for data. Only a currency, actually, I believe, uh, promulgated by the US government with proper Fourth Amendment protections could provide the type of privacy that we need. Now, it's got to be balanced against appropriate law enforcement usage. And we have, again, a long tradition of you know, subpoena process. So a lot of work here for policymakers, and I think a big task for Congress to make sure the social values that are enshrined in the dollar today, the rule of law, economic privacy, um, uh, free enterprise, are enshrined in a digital dollar tomorrow if we go down that road. But I'll, I'll end with this. I think if we get this right, a digital dollar could serve for another generation or more because we've enshrined the privacy rights that got us to where we are today into the future. Well, we can see that uh, digital currencies are going to be important in the future based just on what El, El Salvador has just done. Uh, Haiti wants to follow suit. Uh, any country that has remittances as a major part of their economy is going to be the first users of digital currency. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very apparent why it's upon us. So we absolutely need to do this right. So I really look forward to working with you in the future to make sure we do do it right. Now, Dr. Manand, uh, I want to turn to your comments on financial stability. Uh, a 2016 Bank of England study found that CBDCs have the potential to reduce systemic counterparty risk between financial institutions, especially in times of market stress. A CBDC could allow final settlement and central bank money direct between payer and payee across the Fed's balance sheet. So this would reduce or eliminate capital and collateral that is required to be posted for transactions, including in relation to intraday overdrafts, putting it to more productive use. So do you agree that central bank digital currency has the potential to reduce systemic risk in settlements? Yes, I completely agree. We've we focused so far uh, in the hearing a lot on the retail side and the benefits of for CBDC for ordinary businesses and and individuals and households. Um, but there are also very large uh, benefits for the financial system more generally. And the uh, the Bank of England report that you referenced um, is a good example of some of them. 
Uh, and one thing we've done is we've expanded access to Fed master accounts since the last financial crisis, and that is seen as having stability enhancing effects. And so, um, yes, I, I, I agree with that, Senator. Thanks so much for having this hearing, Madam Chair. I yield back. All right. Thank you, Senator Lamas. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to uh, participate in this uh, important uh, discussion today and really uh, appreciate all the panel panelists and the conversation so far. Let, let me start here. Uh, Dr. Narula, and maybe Mr. Manon, 6.3 uh, of the population in Nevada is unbanked. So my question for you is how could a Federal Reserve uh, run digital currency system make it easier uh, to connect to those unbanked and provide financial relief, direct maybe get, making sure they can access unemployment insurance, social security benefits, uh, et cetera. And, and Dr. Narula, let me start with you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, so I think the key, uh, the key technique here is to remove sources of friction that keep people from being able to access uh, such a digital currency, a US digital dollar. We need to make sure that there aren't onerous restrictions, that people who want to transact in small amounts can do so very, very easily. We also need to make sure that there are the right types of interfaces on top of a digital currency. Uh, it cannot just be a mobile app because so many of the people you reference might not have smartphones. So we have to think about uh, people who are not necessarily very technically literate. And so this means that uh, digital currency, uh, if issued, would need to have a, a wide variety of ways to access it. And that means providing the right kind of interface uh, and making sure that it's a platform that other businesses and uh, uh, applications can build on top of as well. Thank you. Mr. Manon, anything to add? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I would just add that if you're poor today, a bank account can be dangerous for you. It, it has a lot of fees. You might not understand when those fees are going to be levied. So you're in a terrible position. You have to choose between two bad choices. Either you're outside of the banking system and it's really hard for you to get government stimulus payments and to buy things online and to do all sorts of things. Or you go in, but you have a small amount of money and you're going to get hit with account maintenance fees that people with more money don't get hit with and overdraft fees that people with more money don't get hit with, and you might end up, it might end up costing you a lot. And so one of the benefits of a CBDC, of a, of a no-fee account uh, offered by the Federal Reserve of central bank digital money, is it would be provided to the public without profitability considerations. So there, you know, there'd be no sign-up costs, no fees. So people who face that choice right now, they wouldn't have to worry about that because the government wouldn't be trying to make a make make money off of this off of this program they would be providing critical public infrastructure to people and so and let me add to that because i often hear from merchants as well about the high fees for cashless transactions would this address that issue as well for merchants yes there'd be huge benefits for merchants um, and small businesses to be able to have an account uh or, or or central bank digital currency in some form huge yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, let me jump back to um, the, the the privacy issue, but uh, the security issue as well and fraud. Um, really, this is an issue from my background. I'm always cautious about and I, I'm really interested in your thoughts. And let me open it up to the panel. You know, it, we have seen fraud has been a major problem with cryptocurrencies, but how should a Federal Reserve issue digital currency uh, be designed? be implemented and regulated to reduce a risk of fraud? I know we've talked around the edges, but is there something specifically we should be thinking about? And let me open it to the panel. Anybody want to take that on? Uh, Senator, what, mm -hmm. at the Digital Dollar Project, we convened a, a privacy subcommittee of a number of our advisory board members, and, and they set out uh, four principles that they believe a central bank digital currency should carry. The first, of course, is economic privacy for users of a digital dollar as I said before, properly balanced against law enforcement needs. But the second one is that the system must be secure. The ability to use a digital dollar must carry with it security of one's, of one's uh, wealth, of one's value, of one's usage. And then thirdly, the system must be uh, provide greater accessibility than we have, as, as Professor uh, Manon just mentioned, for uh, populations that are traditionally underbanked. And then lastly, the system must have sufficient transparency so that users of the system can know that transactions done on the system have been completed, that there's settlement certainty, that there's payment certainty, 
And those are four values that we think a central bank digital currency must embody. Thank you. Thank you again. I know my time is up. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you. Thank you, Senator Cortez Masto. Senator Daines. Thank you, Chairman Warren. Appreciate it. And thanks to witnesses who are here today. I want to start off by talking about the threat we're seeing from China in this particular space. China, of course, has launched a digital yuan, which it hopes will one day displace the dollar as the world's dominant reserve currency. And even beyond the digital yuan, it's no secret that China and many other countries are well ahead of us with regard to financial innovation. For example, India is also among the fastest growing fintech markets in the world. In fact, India processed nearly 10 billion more real-time payments than China in 2020, $25.5 billion versus $15.7 billion for China. U.S. processed just $1.2 billion of real-time payments. Well, I'm not yet convinced we need a digital dollar. I strongly support further exploration in this important area. It's for this reason I'm heartened by the nonprofit Digital Dollar Project, which will launch five pilot programs over the course of the next 12 months. This type of private sector research will provide data policymakers what they need to inform the debate about the next steps that we are going to take. Mr. Giancarlo, can you describe what the world might look like, looking out five years perhaps, if we continue to let China and others like India race ahead of us in this important area? Thank you, Senator Danes. You know, the reason why we launched this digital project, dollar project is we really believe that the nature of money is, is changing. You know, the internet has been a remarkable thing and it's not done weaving its magic web on, on society. I mean, it started by changing the nature of information dissemination and changing industries like entertainment and, and, and publishing and, and, and travel and leisure and so many things. Well, now it's set its sights on money and in many ways, financial services itself. Uh, the use of distributed ledger technology with tokenized money may present a future very different than the one we know today. Today, we think of a, ne a global network of banking institutions that have been very useful to the United States in sanctions power and, and other areas, but also to clean up money laundering and, and surveil that, that banking network. But in the future, we may see very different networks, networks of digital currency. There may be a yuan network. There may be a dollar-based network. And how these networks interact with each other is going to be of critical importance. And the work of China in, in, in looking at blockchain technology and, and hoping to set the standards of interoperability between these networks is going to be of critical, critical importance. And that's why we so strongly advocate that the United States, whether we eventually launch a digital dollar or not, is almost a second order magnitude issue. The first issue is that we lead in the technological development. We lead in the standard setting. China's standards will be using a network for surveillance of its citizens. Is that what we want in the United States or are our values different? And how do we make sure that the values that got us here, the rule of law, of economic privacy, of, of appropriate law enforcement needs are encoded in that digital future, that those standards for the future? Mr. Giancarlo, thank you for that. I'm going to ask Mr. Duffy the same question. I'm also reminded that uh, you know, India had an order of magnitude more actual uh, transactions real time last year than China did. So there's a, you know, we've got some important players here. Mr. Duffy, anything to add to that? I completely agree with uh, Commissioner Giancarlo. Uh, the, this is about technology at this stage. The United States has fallen behind even India and China with respect to digital currency technology. And the competition uh, for commercial services internationally is very important. U.S. banks have been ceding ground to Chinese banks internationally. And if, if the United States wants to uh, compete, it's going to have to invest in technology in this area, uh, uh, particularly with respect to the, the new uh, uses of digital ledger technology. If the United States were to even develop the technology for central bank digital currency, it could, it's in a private public partnership, its firms could provide those services internationally and compete with Chinese firms that are already uh, positioning to do that, uh, firms like Alibaba. So I, I totally agree with uh, Commissioner Giancarlo. Thanks, Mr. Duffy. I want to uh, shift to this issue of ransomware in uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, these are an, another part of the, 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 the problem and the opportunity we need to continue to study. In the case of Bitcoin, 
75% of it's mined in China. Although businesses in Montana, keep an eye on what's going on in Montana and towns like Butte and Hardin and other cities in the United States are starting to grow mining operations for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies in massive, massive uh, scale. Importantly, these high performance computing operations are capable of doing much more than just mining cryptocurrency. For example, they can be used for artificial intelligence, machine learning applications, which will help us win the future race against China and others. However, I'm worried about the increasing use of cryptocurrencies to pay ransomware to malicious actors. In the case of the Colonial Pipeline, it was encouraging to see the DOJ claw back much of the ransom was paid, but I think we were given a little bit of a lucky break on that one uh, to, 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 for that clawback. Mr. Giancarlo, what can we do to help law enforcement crack down on the illicit use of cryptocurrency, as well as to combat this trend of ransoms being paid following a cyber attack? So this is a new this is a new area, and I will tell you, as the former head of a, of an agency with enforcement capability, whenever you've got money, you're going to have criminality, and a lot of enforcement work is is un, is is just an evolving um, process of cops and robbers. The, the the robbers learn a new technique, and then the cops learn a way to to react to it, and that's been since the beginning of history, and that will be this new technology though presents some interesting uh, both challenges and opportunities. So. So the accounts-based system always begins with identification of identity. Um, and so therefore you have that buried into a transaction and you can work your way back to it as a, as a law enforcement matter. This system is pseudonymous, but it does provide um, ability to track transactions, this new distributed ledger technology. And that's what we saw in this case. We saw in this case that both Bitcoin was was a means for criminality, but it was also actually a, a means for law enforcement. We, we're going to get better at using this technology, but it's, you know, what, what how do they call it? It's, it's old wine and new bottles. At the end of the day, the bad guys are going to figure out some new techniques and the cops are going to be right behind them. And if we do our job, uh, as I said, this is a former regulator, we shouldn't be too far behind in catching up to that activity. Thank you, Giancarlo. Uh Senator Daines, I know that you're over your time, but would you like to ask this of any of the rest of the witnesses? You don't have to, but I just thought it was a really important question. Well, I, I mean, uh, Madam Chairman, thank you for that, because I, I think it is a really important question. And um, now that you know the world is flat, uh, the cops and robbers and so forth, that it's, of course, these are, this is all global in nature and can be attacked from anywhere, literally, uh, in, in the world. Uh, anybody else want to answer? Thanks for that opportunity. Uh, anybody else wanted to... Uh, Talk sure, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Uh, thank, thank you, Senator. Um, and I, I agree with uh, Chairman Giancarlo. I, I would just add that it's not clear to me that um, Department of Justice and the FBI tracked the Bitcoin on the public ledger, uh, and that's how they clawed back the Bitcoin from the ransomware attack the other day, as opposed to doing old-fashioned police work and capturing the physical servers that the criminals in this case were using and then find out what wallet they were storing the cryptocurrencies in. Um, and I think we need to be very concerned about the incentives that um, that cryptocurrencies uh, provide for criminals to do ransomware attacks because we know that with various mixers and tumblers and other cryptocurrencies that you can trade into like Zcash, that criminals who do it right can really make it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to track them using the cryptocurrency, using the money system. Um, there might be other ways to track them down because they exist in the real world and we might be able to recover the money, but the sort of traditional ways that rely on the dollar payment system may not be available. Thank you for that comment. Uh, Mr. Duffy, you, you can get the last word if you want on this. Yeah, uh, well, has been has emphasized, uh, it's very difficult to stop uh, the use of Bitcoin, but you can make it criminal in many different countries. If you have an international agreement among countries that Bitcoin will not be permitted to be converted into the local currency, then the criminals will be trapped with owning Bitcoin that they can't spend. And I think the, the best thing to do is for the US uh, and other countries to get together and agree that uh, in none of their countries will Bitcoin be convertible into the local currency. Great. Well, I thank you very much for the thoughtful comments. Uh, Madam Chair, this has been a, this is a great hearing, great discussion, and thanks for holding this hearing. Uh, thank you for joining us. So uh, I want to say thank you uh, for everybody got a first round question, and some of us want to do a second round. So 
I'm going to recognize myself to do some questions here. You know, we've been talking about this afternoon about how our banking system has cut out too many Americans for too long. We have nearly 33 million households, disproportionately Black and Hispanic, who are underbanked or unbanked altogether. And they pay steep fees to cash checks and pay bills and borrow a little money until payday. But as, as we were talking about earlier, even when people have access to bank accounts, some of those banks use a whole array of abusive practices that harm struggling families, like overdraft fees and fake accounts opened without customers' permission and egregious data breaches, just, just to name a few of these. So I understand why Americans can be very dissatisfied with the banking industry. And the crypto industry has stepped in with the promise of a better and more inclusive financial system for all Americans. The idea is that digital assets and blockchain technology are going to drastically reduce the cost of financial services and improve their quality by eliminating fees and boosting access to capital and providing greater financial privacy and protection. So, uh, Professor Menard, let me go back to you. I know you agree that our banking system is failing to live up to its responsibilities to the American people, but I want to make sure we get this clearly stated. Do cryptocurrencies offer a safer alternative to the traditional banking system for consumers? No, Senator, absolutely not. The the crypto market is rife with consumer abuses. Um, you know, in in, in, in the traditional financial space, we have regulations and consumer protections in place. Those don't apply in the crypto market. So there are companies that offer crypto custody services that have lost customers' money. Um, there's a lot of players that manipulate prices, which leave ordinary users stuck paying high fees. It's not a safe place to keep your money or to invest. And, and I understand the FTC has now said that cryptocurrency scams have skyrocketed. And they say that in five months between October 2020 and March 2021, just in that five month period, nearly 7,000 people lost more than $80 million. And that is nearly a thousand percent increase from the same period a year early. And this just happens in brazen crypto cons. So it, we're seeing egregious uh, uh, fraud cases, but also manipulation in the markets, uh, scams, pump and dump tactics. So, Professor Menand, are there steps that regulators and policymakers could take today to limit the harm to consumers and investors in the cryptocurrency market? Yes, I think so. So uh, we, we, we originally need uh, more regulation and more funding for regulation. So Congress should increase appropriations for the SEC and for Chairman Giancarlo's former agency, the CFTC, so that, you know, they can keep up with all the new coin schemes that are being launched. You know, Chairman Giancarlo spoke about, uh, you know, the, the, the race between, you know, cops and robbers, as it were. Uh, we need to fully fund the cops or they're going to lose the, the race. Congress should also give these agencies additional authority over crypto exchanges. And the banking agency should not allow government-backed banks to warehouse these instruments uh, for their customers. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. You know, it, it, it's clear that Congress and financial regulators need to take action to protect consumers, to protect markets, and to protect our financial system. Uh, Dr. Narula, could a well-designed central bank digital currency actually help people who are poorly ser served by our current banking system? Uh, thanks for the question, Senator. I think that really depends on how it's designed. So uh, if it's designed in such a way that you require, for example, a commercial bank account in order to transact in the central bank digital currency, it's not really going to provide much help beyond the system that we have today. So I think it's really important to think about accessibility, making sure that it's open and that people, uh, we remove frictions in the way of people getting access to such a central bank digital currency. Thank you. Yeah, big banks are too focused on boosting the multi-million dollar pay of their CEOs instead of serving their customers. But cryptocurrencies aren't the solution that their promoters claim that they are. 
With no cop on the beat, this unregulated market draws in rip-off artists promising massive returns. It, Americans need trustworthy and affordable ways to store and use their money, not a way to get scammed more efficiently. A well-designed and carefully implemented central bank digital currency could bring more households into the banking system and ensure that everyone has access to the financial services they need if the design is right. So thank you all. Senator Kennedy, would you like to do a second round of questions? I, I would, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? I can. Uh, first, let me thank all our, our uh, witnesses. You have been terrific. I've got a, a, a couple of, uh, of uh, quick questions. I'd like to get to all four of you to to uh, experience uh, the expertise of each of you. So if you could just give me some brief answers. Number one, uh, one of the advantages, it seems to me, of uh, let's say Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency Bitcoin, people like the fact that uh, it's a decentralized ledger. They like the fact that uh, uh, it's private in the sense that the information is encrypted. Uh, uh, I guess what I'm saying is, let, let me start with uh, with Dr. Uh, Narula. Could we establish a digital dollar where the information, the, the transactions are encrypted using blockchain technology? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, yeah, so um, blockchain technology has gotten a lot of attention, but uh, encryption and techniques like it existed well before the first blockchain, which was uh, Bitcoin. But yes, indeed, I think that uh, encryption will form a core part of any central bank digital currency that is launched uh, simply because it's best practice and it's a very important tool to enable privacy. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Professor Manand, is it Manand or Manan? Manan, Senator. Professor, other than, and I'm not minimizing uh, what I'm about to mention, but other than uh, making our payment system more efficient, cheaper, quicker, uh, what other advantages do you see to to the to a digital dollar? Somebody mentioned the ability of China through its digital yuan to access some new commercial possibilities. Uh, maybe you want to elaborate on that. I don't know. I don't mean to give you the answer. Uh, look, Senator, I think easy and cheaper to transfer. These are the cardinal virtues of a money and payment system. So one response is just what more do you need than a, a system that's doing? But um, I would say that offering non-defaultable money with no maximum amount would be stabilizing for the U.S. financial system in ways that uh, people haven't thought about. Um, so large companies right now don't have access to that. And it, it would be very helpful to large companies to be able to hold very, very large cash balances in non-defaultable amounts. And this could crowd out a lot of unsafe and unstable uh, alternative products that those companies use right now. And I think if we called up the CEOs of the top, uh, top you know, S&P 500, they would all like to be able to do that, to have safer digital money. And uh, that's, a, that's an additional benefit um, that is different from easy and cheap to transfer. Dr. Duffy. Uh, yeah, well, in addition to uh, everything that's mentioned, uh, central bank digital currency is fungible. It's interoperable. What that, what that means is when I, when I go into your store and I want to pay for something, I don't have to fish around for the correct uh, applicate, you know, uh, button on my mobile phone to use. Mm -hmm. When I want to pay a friend for dinner, I don't have to ask him, well, do you have Venmo or Zelle, or, or or can I just give you some paper money? We can just instantly move money back and forth. That makes money move faster. It makes it easier for the central bank to implement monetary policy because when the Fed raises interest rates, for example, or lowers interest rates, interest rates throughout the economy will follow very closely because the, it's the same kind of money moving everywhere very quickly. So that's that's an additional advantage is getting the central bank monetary policy implemented well. And again, the technology uh, can be exported for commercial advantage uh, to other countries if the U.S. has the technology. But if it waits for China to develop the technology first, then the U.S. is going to lose commercial advantage. Chairman Giancarlo, let me ask you this um, in the few minutes I have left. Does the Federal Reserve have the authority, in your opinion, to do all this 
unilaterally on its own, own or does it need congressional authority? Well, well rather than, than my opinion, and perhaps what's more important is, is Chairman Powell's opinion. I think he said recently that the Federal Reserve would require more authority to do this. Having said right. that, I, I think there's a fair amount of authority to do some basic level exploration, the work that's already being done at the Reserve, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston with uh, with uh, our Professor Rurula's help, but also in the private sector. And that's what we're doing at the Digital Dollar Project. We're going to bring the resources of the private sector to bear to do some experimentation, do it on a fully transparent basis, make everything we, that comes out of our experiments fully available, and do it in a way that it complements the work of the Fed, doesn't com conflict with it. Look at some of the social use cases, the commercial use cases, the societal use cases, and as and, and working with responsible actors, make that information available for use by the private by the public sector. Ultimately, these big decisions are going to be made by Congress. They're going to be made by an administration. They're 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 big, weighty issues. But the public does have something to say on these issues, and so we can bring that to bear. Hopefully, the decision that comes out is one. That, that meets our social needs and also meets our, our monetary needs and our and our and the core value of, of money, which is a social good. Well, let me thank you all again. It's somewhat unusual to have as many senators as we had today participate in a, uh, a, a subcommittee hearing like this. And, and I think that's an indication of how interesting this topic is and the expertise to which you bring to it. Thank you all, and thank our chair for, for doing this. So thank you, Senator Kennedy. And with your indulgence, I have one more issue I'd like to talk about. Absolutely. And of course, good. And you're welcome to do another round of questions if you want. Is it, is it, about, is it about overdraft fees? No. <laughs> this, this one's a little different. I had to okay. ask. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So it, it's about, we've talked a lot today about the dangers that cryptocurrencies pose to our economy. We've talked about the ripoffs, the instability, the extent to which they're used to help criminals with cyber attacks, like the attack on Colonial Pipeline and JBS. But there's another piece too, the adverse environmental impacts of the computing activity used to mint many of these digital currencies in the first place. Bitcoin consumes more energy than entire countries, and it is projected to consume as much energy as all the data centers in the whole world this year. One Bitcoin transaction, a single purchase, sale, or transfer, uses the same amount of electricity as the typical U.S. household uses in more than a month. So, do, yeah. So, Dr. Can you say Nuru, that again? say that again? Elizabeth? Yep. A single Bitcoin transaction. That's one purchase or one sale or one transfer uses the same amount of electricity as the typical US household uses in more than a month. I think the estimate is 53 days. Wow. Yeah. So, Dr. Narula, could you explain why cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin eat up so much energy? Uh, certainly, uh, Senator Warren. Uh, so, I, what I what I think it's important to note here is that, at least from a computer science perspective, Bitcoin was doing something that we had never done before, which was uh, building a system that was secure enough to support a, a, a massive currency and at the same time allow anyone to participate. The technique that the creator of Bitcoin used uh, in order to do that, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, was what we refer to as mining um, or proof of work. And the idea is that uh, the participants in the Bitcoin network protocol, because we don't necessarily know who they are and we want to uh, make the protocol open for anyone to join, uh, uh, without being able to flood the system with copies of, 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 a, of a person, for example, uh, is that they prove who they are by contributing compute power. So uh, the way that Bitcoin works is that in order to build the next, uh, the next block on the blockchain, um, the participants in the network compete to solve a puzzle. Uh, it's a it's a very, very difficult puzzle to solve at the moment. And in fact, the, the puzzle difficulty changes depending upon how many participants there are in the network. Uh, what that has led to as the price of Bitcoin has gone up 
is uh, more and more resources being brought to bear, more and more compute resources being brought to bear to solve this puzzle. Uh, and as a result, that is used quite a bit more energy. That is also how the blockchain is secured. The idea is that once these participants have expended this energy and expended this compute power, the, uh, in order to rewrite the blockchain, in order to change history, one would have to expend an equivalent amount of power and energy. So it's a, it's a pretty fundamental part of the underlying security of Bitcoin. So, so it's built right into it that there are computers all over the world right now spitting out random numbers around the clock in a competition to try to solve a useless puzzle and win the Bitcoin reward. And the amount of computational power and energy for this is a disaster for our planet. Now, some crypto advocates claim that these environmental costs are worth it because of the security the proof of work validation process provides for the system and you were talking about this is the security that's built in but let me ask you professor Manan, do you think the environmental costs inflicted by cryptocurrencies like bitcoin are worth whatever potential benefits they provide no I, absolutely not especially uh especially for countries like the United States, where the benefits of crypto are largely illusory. Um, they're not a better means of payment. They undermine the government's ability to maintain robust economic growth over time. They circumvent important safeguards that we've been talking about that prevent extortion. Uh, and the environmental costs are very, very large. Um, and so I, I think the cost benefit analysis on Bitcoin is clear. All right, so, so let me ask you then, Professor Manant, What's the end game for Bitcoin? Will more and more miners keep doing more and more useless, complicated math problems that consume a larger and larger share of the world's energy for the next hundred years until the last coin is mined? Um, what is the future of Bitcoin and the future of our planet? I think a lot depends on how the people uh, in this Zoom uh, react. Um, you know, if governments like ours continue to sit on the sidelines while alternative currency systems develop, or even if they give uh, sucker to that development, um, we're going to see uh, Bitcoin use uh, continue to expand because there's a growing group of people who would like to move sort of the whole financial system to decentralized ledgers. Um, and uh, that's going to mean more and more environmental damage. So Congress, I think, really needs to act here. Yeah. So as we think about how to build a better banking system, we need to rethink the use of environmentally wasteful cryptocurrencies. If I can, let me just get through these quickly. Uh, Dr. Narula, let me ask you, from the research you and your colleagues at MIT have done, is it possible to design a central bank digital currency that does not require miners to perform random number generation puzzles? Uh, yes, it is. And could you design it so it wouldn't consume more energy than a middle-sized country? Uh, yes, you can. And could we have a central bank digital currency that doesn't exacerbate the climate crisis and undermine environmental justice? Uh, I, I think you could build a central bank digital currency which does not consume vast amounts of energy, yes. Good. I'm glad to hear this. Look, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are terrible for the environment. And that would be true regardless of whether we were getting anything productive out of that energy usage or not. The fact that we're not makes it even more scandalous. One of the easiest and least disruptive things we can do to address the climate crisis is cracked down on environmentally wasteful cryptocurrencies, and now is the time to do it. So I wanna thank all of our witnesses for being here today. I wanna thank you for providing testimony. You've just been terrific. Uh, I wanna uh, thank uh, you. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, can I yes. ask Dr. Dr. Uh, Narula one other question? Of course, in line of course with you can. You I just want to follow up one last question in line with your uh, questions. Can we design that digital currency in a way that that respects people's privacy? 
Uh, I certainly hope so, Senator Kennedy. And I think if we can't design it in such a way, then then that is a that is a very important factor to take into account when considering whether to launch. Um, but my hope is that we can, and that is the research that we're engaging in now. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, if it's all right, I have a follow up to that. Of course, probably, Senator last, Cortez last Masto. And uh, Dr. Narula, because you've been at this for a period of time. So can you talk about with respect to digital currency, why you recommend that the platform have an open application programming interface? Uh, yes, Senator, I think this is critical. Uh, so we, I, I, I don't think that we'll realize the true benefit of digital currency unless uh, we upgrade it into the 21st century, so to speak. We have an opportunity here to learn from what's happened in the cryptocurrency world. And I understand a lot of the senators here are uh, not big fans of that world. Uh, but what I see there is a lot of very exciting applications that are being built um, and a lot of experimentation that's happening uh, that granted also comes along with a lot of scams. However, uh, I think we would be missing an opportunity if we didn't take a look at what was happening there and try to learn lessons from the cryptocurrency world and bring some of that back into uh, a central bank digital currency design. Uh, I think that if we were able to create a well-designed interface to a central bank digital currency, we could do for the transfer of value what the internet did for the transfer of information, which is create a platform for innovation. Uh, so create a platform where we could have new applications and new businesses uh, facilitating the transfer of value in, in exciting new ways. Yeah, but if you would talk a little bit about the security piece of that, because there, that means there's more eyes when you have an open application program interface. There's more people engaged and watching what's going on that brings more of that security. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely. So I'm a firm believer that open source software is critical right. for security. Um, the more people who are looking, the more likely you are to find bugs and to find problems. Along with the innovation, but there is the security. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Senator. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, the ranking Any, member. Anyone else have a question? Are we good? Good. Well, as I was saying, I want to say thank you to our witnesses. Obviously, you were uh, very engaging today, and I appreciate your being here. Uh, I want to thank Senator Kennedy for being such a great partner and for suggesting this hearing. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Uh, and for any senators who want to submit questions for the record, those questions are due a week from today. That's Wednesday, June 16th. For our witnesses, you'll have 45 days to respond to any of those questions. And again, Thank you very much, and with that, this hearing is adjourned.